Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. This week, Volkswagen introduced the eighth generation of its Golf hatchback, a global car that's one of the best-selling automobiles of all time. It offers a comically long list of power options, and it looks, well, it looks like Golfs have looked for decades, uh, just a little newer. On today's episode, we're going to talk about this mega important debut, as well as hatchbacks in general. They're, they're a curious type of car that Europeans love, and we Americans seem to change our minds about a lot. Joining me is MotorOne.com writer Chris Bruce. How are you doing, Chris? Doing great. Glad to be here. And in the other chair is senior editor Greg Fink. How are you doing, Greg? Great, John. How are you? Very good. Thanks. So the Golf debuted just a few hours before we started recording, um, and it's been very popular on the site. Everyone's interested in it. Um, and it's a very global car. Like I said, it's one of the best selling of all time. Actually, it's number three on the list behind the Ford F-Series pickup, which is number two. And you guys know what is number one? It's the Corolla, if you go by nameplate, right? It is. It is the Corolla. Uh, so it's uh, the, the Golf is third on the list. So uh, Chris, you wrote uh, the debut post on Motor One all about this car, and I sympathize with you because it was a very long press release that you had to synthesize and uh, summarize for everybody. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Can you tell us uh, kind of the main highlights of the new Golf? Sure thing. So the new Golf, it it's in terms of size it's practically identical to the old golf um if you look at it it's just a hair longer it's less than an inch longer it's actually skinnier than the old one and the wheelbase changed by get this a single millimeter so it's <laughs> pretty much Why as bother close counting? to the old one you could do you could have as you can imagine in terms of styling they really sharpened it up especially at the front the front is where you'll notice most of the changes the rear also has sharper tail lights and things like that but where you really notice the difference is inside um a uh, digital instrument cluster like you would find on audis is now standard across the board on the golf which is really impressive you get an eight and a quarter inch infotainment system standard um and you can upgrade to a 10 inch system and those look really nice together from the photos that we're getting um and then it just has a lot of tech like it volkswagen really kind of packed this thing with cutting it cutting edge features um people with certain samsung phones are going to be able to use that as the vehicle's key and you're even going to be able to let other people into your car with your samsung phone key so that's both scary in a certain way and then also very <laughs> interesting bit, yeah. and in this then, age of hackers um uh uh, as an optional feature, they're having what they call travel assist, which is their driver assistance system. But it will ba it will do all braking, uh, gas, steering in a single lane for you. Um, so th and at speeds up to 131 miles per hour, which is great for the oh, autobahn. Wow. Not so much for Americans, but still. And um, it also gets car to X communication, which is something we've been hearing about for a really long time. And that means that it can communicate wirelessly both with other cars and with the infrastructure once that's supported. Um, in this case, it is up to 2,625 feet, 800 meters radius. So any cars with this feature, and it is a unified system in Europe, so it won't just be Volkswagens eventually, um, and they will be able to communicate with each other. And so your car will know if there is a broken down car up the road or a wreck or, you know, people are slowing down. So that could be really important for safety in the future. Yeah, so. that's a really cool technology. But I mean, it takes um, like not just widespread adoption, it kind of takes 100% adoption to get the full advantage of. But right. once yeah. that's set up, you know, being able for for cars, being able to communicate with each other. And, and, and I, I like the idea of cars knowing exactly the position of other cars around them. Uh, that's cool. And also the car to infrastructure is really cool. Like, you know, um, you could be pulling up to a McDonald's and you've already got your order, you know, on file in your car. And as you pull up, it just, you know, beeps it, in, it beeps it into them when you pull into the parking lot. Um, of course, yeah, it's early days I for all this food. stuff, but yeah, <laughs> sorry for interrupting you. It's early um, days for all this stuff, but it's interesting that they're adopting it now. Um, it, you know, if someone buy, someone who buys one on the first day that they're available, they're probably not going to get a, be able to take advantage of that tech as much as you know maybe 
five, 10 years down the line when it'll really be useful. Yeah, but you got to start somewhere and cars are on the road for five to 10 years now. So it makes sense. I I have to say, let me, let me give my opinion on uh, both of what you just talked about, the exterior and the interior, the exterior to me, uh, I'm disappointed with, but I feel like I'm kind of always disappointed with new golfs because they always look like old golfs. uh, As I mentioned in the introduction, they're just, they're always evolutionary. They're, they're never revolutionary. Um, and obviously that's by design and this is a, an incredibly important iconic car for Volkswagen and maybe they're just not interested in taking a risk with it. But for me, I think that is true of a lot of Volkswagen and of its, uh, sister brand Audi, where they just, they, they have kind of fallen into a rut of evolving their designs to the point where when a new design is out, it doesn't really feel new. It just feels a little different. Um, that said, man, the inside, the interior, the dashboard is extremely, uh, futuristic and, and you're right, packed with tech. Uh, obviously the, the screens jump out at you because there's one for the gauge cluster behind the steering wheel and a giant one, um, above the center console. And to me, they kind of remind me of the current setup that, uh, Mercedes has where it has kind of two giant screens on the same plane, uh, the same horizontal plane across the dash. This is a little bit similar. These two in the Gulf, these two giant screens are kind of right next to each other and, and almost look like they're together, but they're not. Yeah. Um, But it's worth pointing out that, you know, the Gulf is a whole price class lower than an A class or a CLA and you're still getting that tech. So I think that's that's important to point out. Yeah, the the trickle down of of it's really the trickle down of like screen size that has sure. has come down uh, into the the least expensive cars um, on the market, uh, which is great. I mean, I remember five years ago where there was still a question of whether you'd get a screen or not. There mm-hmm. you'd, get, you'd either get a screen or you'd get like a little LCD display in in a giant swath of plastic where a screen would be but now they just give everybody the screen and it's just a matter of whether you get like navigation with it or not and you brought this up but this thing at least in europe is available with just a hilarious number of powertrain options volkswagen's actual press release makes says it's eight but in in the office we counted through them and actually came up with 11 three cylinders and four cylinders there's five hybrids there's two different diesel options it's just it's crazy that they're offering this one vehicle at launch with so many powertrains. And we know that there are more on the way because the GTI and the Golf R and stuff like that are coming. And probably, I, I don't know, do you th- are, do they say whether they do pure electric versions? Isn't that what ID is for? Yeah, is that what they're replacing the e-Golf with? Is just ID, the, that line of vehicles? I think that might be the case. I yeah. would imagine. I don't know, though. The ID Uh, impresses me more than this new Golf, I got to say. I'm a little disappointed with the Golf when this ID is here, and I think the ID3 seems to make more of a splash, and the Golf kind of does a lot, but is still a Golf. For better or worse, I agree. Look at that. Look at the ID3's design, and it looks like what I imagine a good redesign for the Golf should be. Like it, it's a it's a futuristic, forward-looking version of like a Volkswagen hatchback. Whereas this Golf 8, to me, is just it's just a different Golf. It doesn't feel like a new Golf so much as just another take on the Golf. Well, to be fair, Volkswagen is notorious for doing this. The last one, like Mark 5 and 6 were on the same platform and it, Mark six was really just a super facelifted, you know, lots more than your normal, just a new front fascia type of thing going on, mm-hmm. but it's still the same chassis underneath. And this is MQB underneath. It's just a very heavy, they call it a redesign, but you can make the argument. It's a very, very, very heavy facelift. But you're right, uh, Chris, I, I want to go back to the fact that there's 11, 11 different power options for the current one, and that's not including the GTI that we know is coming. Uh, and then what are the other versions besides the GTI? Uh, Golf R and... Oh, the diesel GTI yeah, right. version, the GTD? The GTE, which is the... Oh, that's they right. showed the a plug in one of it. Wow. wow. Yeah, that's the I, GTE. Yeah. That one's the only so one that interests me. Did you see the little... Uh, <laughs> like fog lamps area that are the fog lamps that are kind of built into the honeycomb pattern on the lower grill. Uh, no, I didn't look at it on that one. It's cool. Uh, the GTE is kind of got me. It's got like 240 horsepower. It's a plug in and I bet add some red accents and you pretty much have a GTI from how it looks. Right. Right. 
Well, let's um, the fact that there are these uh, the high performance options that are on their way uh, kind of leads us into the next uh, thing we should talk about concerning the golf, which is the fact that uh, the regular golf may not even come to the U.S. This debut uh, happened in in Europe, and obviously uh, they're going to sell all of these versions of the golf in Europe. Uh, But as we reported earlier in the year, uh, Volkswagen has not decided whether it will sell the regular Golf in the U.S., although they have told us the higher performance versions, uh, they they will continue to sell in the U.S. And that's funny because I've pointed out to you guys uh, at the beginning of the month when the sales numbers come out, uh, I've brought up the fact that in the U.S., the high performance Golfs, the GTI and the R, actually outsell the regular version of the Golf, uh, which is kind of uh, hilarious and a little sad for a car that you know, has um, sold so many, uh, sold enough to be the third best-selling car of all time, and and it really doesn't sell that well in the U.S. Um, so I want to put that question to you. If you were a Volkswagen executive and had to make the decision, um, considering what's in your lineup now and what the trends are and the tastes are in the U.S., would you decide to sell this Golf 8 in the U.S.? Uh, Chris, what would your answer be? It's that's a hard question because you also have to remember that the Beetle is getting the axe too. So if if they only offer the GTI, the GTI then is going to become the entry level Volkswagen or Volkswagen car at least. Um, and that's kind of a weird thought. Well, and they're not even selling the ID3 here. So like they, right. they're not going to have a small hatchback, really. You're right, unless you go up to the to the high performance golfs. It's just weird to think of as a GTI as the entry level Volkswagen car. Well, the Jetta would be the entry level car still. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? You're be, absolutely right. It'd be the entry level hatchback at least. Yeah. Yes, that's the one it would be. But, and um, honestly, they have right. what's it called? I, I don't know why I'm blanking out on the name, but the new smaller SUV Tarak or something like that. Well, I there's the the T Rock in Europe. T Rock, but there's the other one that's going to be built in Mexico. I want to say that's uh, coming up here. I want to say it's called Terok. I'll double check that before the end of this. Um, it's probably going to start at a price that more levels the playing field to keep people able to get into a Volkswagen hatchback at around the price of the current Golf. Yeah, I'm going to say uh, if I were a Volkswagen executive, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bring it over. They already have. Um, we've reported on the fact that they have at least at least two more crossovers coming to the United States. Right. And I, th- and I think one of them is, is the even smaller one you're talking about. Um, uh, Greg, I would like them. I would like to see them bring the ID three over They're go- They're going to bring, a, uh, an all electric, um, uh, small crossover based on the ID three. Uh, but I would actually like the, the, the ID three over as a small hatchback. Um, but you know, it's just the the again when you look at the tastes and trends in the U.S. and and just how uh, SUV obsessed we are, um, I think they could probably sell more if they it, sell more units of, of of vehicles if they just sold a golf sized SUV rather than the golf itself. Um, you know, like I said, like I said at the beginning, Europeans are have always been in love with hatchbacks and it makes sense for I think the geography you know with shorter trips smaller roads things like that uh and in the U.S. they uh, we love them sometimes like when they're interesting like when they are the GTI or the Golf R but just regular hatchbacks kind of come and go in this market and no one really bats an eye at them well and then the other thing too is I want to be sad that this Golf I don't think will end up coming here if I were Volkswagen I agree I would not bring it here I want to be sad about that, but then I think about it, if I were in the buying position, which the Golf is a vehicle I love and I would buy, I would never get the regular Golf. I would get the GTI at least, and they're bringing that here. So they're satisfying my needs. They're satisfying their business needs. It makes the most sense to just keep it at the, you know, make performance people happy with GTI and R, and the hatchback people will move to it is the Tarek, T-A-R-E-K is what it's supposed to be called, the Tarek or a Tiguan or something that, you know, or a Jetta if they are willing to give up the hatch. They have options, though. Yeah, I, you know, again, uh, going back to the sales numbers, if they don't bring the regular golf to the U.S., we're only talking like a thousand units a month. Like, like it's it, it it sells very low volume here in the U.S. So even if it's, if it, I don't, I don't think anybody would miss it. I you know I think it would be a footnote um, in history that that it's not sold here anymore. But as a business decision, I don't know. I think. Um, 
I, I, I think they'd be smarter to execute the plans they have, uh, keep it crossover heavy. Um, although, like I said, I would like to th- see the ID3 here. The the crossover version of the ID3, by the way, is the is uh, the unimpressively named ID4. Um, so that's what we're going to get, which is basically just kind of a jacked up I3, ID3. Um, so we were talking a little bit before the podcast too about the golf in general, and and there have been so many versions um, sold both uh, in the U.S. and around the world that we know we have our favorites. So. Um, in honor of the eighth generation of the golf debuting, uh, let's go around the horn and talk about our favorite golfs of all time. So again, Chris, I'm going to start with you. Why don't you give us uh, one or two of your favorite golf models of all time? Sure thing. Uh, so first, I have to mention the Mark II GTI. Uh, it arrived in the U.S. in 85. Um, I have fond memories of these because my science teacher in high school drove one, and I always thought that was cool. And I've just... Uh, they kind of, well, the first gen, the Rabbit GTI in the U.S. kind of created the hot hatch genre. The Mark II is what really cemented it. Um, just great boxy German styling, really fun to drive, great looking. I, I love them. Um, in addition to that, moving several decades forward, um, there's the kind of the often forgotten Golf R32, which was, uh, it, it was introduced in Europe in 2003. It came to the U.S. in 2004, and it was essentially the kind of the ultimate performance version at the time. Um, it used a 3.2 liter version of the famous VR6 that has predated it and then kept going well, well afterwards. It had all-wheel drive. It was just kind of a it was just a killer at the time. Plus they look good. They had a really kind of aggressive yet handsome body kit on them. Yeah. I think it's one of the, I think the R32 is one of the most handsome golfs ever made. If not, what it really does well is that it does look kind of, you know, mean and aggressive. It's got kind of really big side sills and larger intakes than you you usually see, but it doesn't go overboard. It still has that kind of classic Germanic thing of being handsome and aggressive at the same time. Yeah, very good choices. Very good choices. Uh, Greg, how about you? Well, I agree with that R32, and that actually might be my favorite, but I have some skin in the game. Having been a former Jetta GLX VR6 Mark III owner, it's not a Golf, but I love that car, and I'd be happy to have the Golf version of it. It was, that VR6 was just so fun, and the car's kind of light. It's kind of not probably not the most fun of the gtis to like the real gti fans but i i loved it and i gotta give that car the nod for me yeah very good choice mark three was 94 through 98 i want to say okay um my choices are two two oddballs um you guys i think stayed on the the straight and narrow i'm gonna i'm gonna choose some offbeat ones the first one is the harlequin harlequin golf um and if you guys uh probably know what i'm talking about because they pop up every once in a while and like uh for sale or bring a trailer uh but these are the golfs where um uh volkswagen basically took a body panel from every color golf and put them all on one car so uh and, and they could be it could be anything so for instance like the hood could be red the front fender's yellow the front bumper blue uh, the door front door's red, the, the D pillar green. And it was really just a simple idea. Cause you know, it's not hard to, you know, paint these parts separately and then assemble them. Well, they were all uh, the existing colors too. So they just exactly. like, take a green fender off of that side of the assembly line, take a blue door and yeah, exactly. And it's so strange to look at, uh, because it doesn't look like what you might expect it. Like I, when I describe it in words, I, I think in my head, like a junkyard special where like, you know, somebody, you know, got hit in the door and they replaced it with, you know, a door from a junkyard. Uh, it's not like that because these are all like pristine, well-painted panels. They're just all different colors. And what I think is interesting about it is when it's, when it's all one color, kind of the the door lines and the hood lines those all kind of blend away a little bit but when they're all different colors all those lines are suddenly an extreme relief right there there you're seeing exactly where the door line is because there's two contrasting colors there uh i don't i don't know if i could drive, <laughs> drive one every day and answer the questions that i'm sure you get when you're driving uh this car uh but i just think it was one of the coolest 
f- most fun things I've ever seen uh, come out of an automaker. The, the second one is another rare one. Uh, it wasn't produced very long. It was early 90s, and it was called the Golf uh, Country uh, or the Golf Country Synchro. And it was basically a five-door golf, um, again, like in 1990s, um, jacked up and uh, with four-wheel drive. So it was almost like the small crossover uh, progenitor of the Tiguan or something like that. Um, long before SUVs and crossovers became popular. Um, and, you know, it was underpowered. It had like a hundred and, you know, a hundred some horsepower engine and a five speed. Uh, and they weren't, they were, were not sold in the U S however, you can find them for sale every once in a while. And every time they pop up, it catches my eye. Um, but they look but really again, cool. They have a brush bar on the front. Like they look way more aggressive than they should. Yeah. Then you it would looks think. like someone modified them, but they didn't. Yes, it, exactly. That's a great way to put it. It looks like a one-off custom thing that a shop did, but no, it came from the factory. And I, I've always seen them in this kind of light blue, I don't know, is it teal or like blue-green color? I've never seen them in like any other color except maybe maybe they were produced in others, but this is the most popular one they're usually seen in. Um, and yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those cars where every time I see one for sale, I'm like, man, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind, uh, having that in my garage. That would be really fun. Uh, but I've, I've owned a lot of, uh, mid eighties and early nineties VWs. I don't know if I want to do that again. That's a young man's game. I should say real quick uh, before we move on, I think I said Mark four when I meant Mark three before, because I'm brain farting. It's been a long week. I'm moving as well. So I take that one, and I looked the years up. Mark III was 93 through 98 in the U.S. Okay, so then your choice is Mark III, 93 to 98, uh, either Golf GTI or Jetta GL6. Yeah, With GLI the VR6, the VR6, though, right? With the VR6. Okay, gotcha. But all I right. might have said Mark IV earlier. It's been one of those weeks. That's all right. You corrected it now, so we don't have to do a retraction. Mm-hmm. Um, the now, VR6 just seems like such a big engine for those cars, doesn't it? Like... You see this little car, and then it's got a pretty decent-sized engine in it. It, it. They're interesting. It was a very well, American was, way to go about it, I feel like. It's like the muscle car equivalent of a hot hatch. Yeah, yeah. wasn't the VR6 like a very compact six-cylinder because its um, angle of degree was a little little smaller? It was than most super V6s? tight. It was compact. Yeah. Yeah. For it's an, got one more. head on the top as opposed yeah. to you know having two sets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a cool V engine. in the cylinder, but yeah, it only had one head, so it was compact for an like compared to a normal inline six, but it was you know, V six. I don't think probably a little what about less hatchbacks. Wide. What about hatchbacks in general? Are you guys fans, or or could you take them or leave them? Of the three cars that I've owned, at least arguably two of them were have been hatchbacks. If I my first car was the original, the first gen Saab nine hundred. So mm-hmm. whether you want to call that a liftback or a hatchback. So I, yeah. I am definitely a hatch fan. I don't think you're allowed to be in this business and not be a fan of hatches. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not anti-hatch, but I, I went back, you know, looking through the cars I've owned, and I have had hatchbacks. Uh, I had an '84 Celica and an early '80s Dodge Charger, but I also didn't think of them as hatchbacks so much as coupes, you know. And sometimes, you know, uh, hatchbacks can be really like a coupe shape, and the fact that they're a hatchback is just a function of where the hinge is for, you know, their the the rear door, whether it's a trunk or or a, or a hatch. Um, when I think of hatchbacks, though, I think of, you know, golfs and minis and things like that. And, and I've actually never owned one one of those, um, you know, not because uh, I haven't wanted to. Although I actually I take that back. Uh, we we just recently got rid of it, but we had a 2014 Kia Soul. And most people can. Well, some people consider that a hatchback, uh, which it, of course, is. Oh, yeah, but, I totally think it is. I also viewed it as a subcompact crossover, which many people do not because it does not have four wheel drive. So it's definitely a hatchback, though. And we did love it. But I, again, I didn't like walk up to it seeing a hatchback. When I think hatchback, I think more low to the ground, uh, you know, golf and, and like I said, mini and things like that. And See, I lumped the soul in with the Scion XB and Nissan Cube. Yeah, the box cars. Yeah. I th- yeah. So, and I consider both of those hatches. I wouldn't call either one of those a crossover. But. No, I wouldn't either. That was, de- but that was also definitely like a weird offshoot of like box cars that that existed and only the Soul survived. Yeah, um, uh, and did so well. I mean, Are I you saying it's the, the Soul Survivor? 
It is the sole survivor. <laughs> oh, man. You are our best title writer, uh, Greg, and I'm glad to see that translate to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, have you ever owned any uh, hashbacks, Greg? Uh, yeah, I had a Mini Cooper S in 03 uh, back probably a decade ago. I know Chris has a Mini Cooper as well, not the S, so missing out on that supercharger, but it's a fantastic car either way. Yep. I So funny you should mention that. I took delivery of it October 31st, so almost, we're only a few weeks out, of 2005. So oh my God. It, and it's still in the garage, and I, yeah, I still have it. So it's coming up on 14 have on it? years. It's like a week away. How many miles are on it? Uh, just shy of 60. Oh my God. How many miles do you drive? Like so, two a week? The thing is... I, I got it when I was in college, and then I spent a little over... So I didn't drive that much in college, and then sure. I moved to Germany for a little over a year, and so my parents would occasionally drive it to work just to put miles on it. So there was kind of... There was some time when it was more or less off the road. So, yeah, it, it's very low mileage. Wow. For 14 years, man. That's, that's getting your money's worth, though. Good oh, job. totally. Yeah, I've had nary a problem with that. I had a misfire a few years ago and had some little minor stuff. The uh, uh, the um, coolant overfill tank cracked, which is a really common issue. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a good I car. I feel like modern minis, especially the first generation, um, were uh, a lot of car enthusiasts, not just ones that turned into journalists like us, but it's, it's a very common popular car with enthusiasts because it's functional and it's fun. Yeah. And I mean, it's super times, tossable. That's what I love about exactly. like, even when I go get the groceries during the weekend, I'll, you know, kind of wind it out in second. And it's nice because it's a slow car that you can drive fast yeah. and it feels kind of, you know, they talk about go-kart like handling and it kind of has that to a certain extent, but it only has, I think that it's 118 horsepower, 120, something like that. So it's not that much power in a very tossable thing. So you can kind of rev it out and pretend like you're going fast and not be breaking the law. And that's the first gen of the modern Mini uh, before they got uh, all big and fat, too. So right. that's everyone's, well, uh, and, I think, still everyone's favorite. And Chris, yours is an 05. And is it a stick shift? It is. Yeah, so you have the Getra gearbox and not the crummy, yes. what was it, Midlands in the earlier ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very a, nice. You have the, nice. the prime one of the non S's. I, I, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Hold on so. to it. Yeah, man. It'll start appreciating eventually. <laughs> yeah, if I keep it long enough. <laughs> yeah, lock it up. Stop driving it. Uh, or right, keep driving um, it. At this rate, it's only going to have 80,000 miles by 20 years. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you could put miles, fast enough, uh, up, miles on it fast enough to make a difference. Um, all right. Well, uh, that's that's it for the Golf 8. We're going to um, wait for some more information like pricing and the all-important information of whether or not it's going to come to the U.S. Uh, that's what we're waiting for. Uh, but in the meantime, a lot of other things have happened this week, and I want to bring up uh, two in particular. And the first one has to do with the Mustang, but it isn't the Mustang. And I, what I'm talking about is uh, the upcoming uh, Mustang-inspired electric crossover coming from Ford. Uh, we don't know the name of it yet, although the name Mach 1 has been thrown around, uh, but there was a little bit of backlash. Uh, the news this week, though, is that Ford released a teaser, and it's a side profile. It's not a photo. It's more just like lines that show the shape of it. Um, but this is the clearest kind of look we've had at what this uh, machine is going to look like, and a couple of things I'll point out that are that are really obvious from this teaser. One is it's you know definitely indicating in the tail light area that the tail lights are going to be very Mustang like. It's got like three lines that I think indicate uh, the three sections of the tail lights of the Mustang that are pretty iconic. Also, the the hood shape looks very Mustang like as well. But it's I would also say the headlights do too. Yeah, the headlights as well. I, it's unmistakably, though, a crossover. You know, it's not it's not a coupe. Um, and I think what we don't know and what they don't show in the teaser at all, they don't show the wheels or the fenders and particularly the ride height. And that's what I'd like to know is, is this thing going to be high riding? High riding? Is it going to be tall? Or is this kind of going to be a little lower to the ground, which I think would actually be really cool if it were. 
Um, now we've all had a chance to see it, so I wanted to get some reactions. Uh, Greg, what do you think of this teaser? Does it uh, make you excited for the debut, um, which happens uh, November seventeenth? Um, are you still pretty skeptical about whether or not this car is going to turn out to be a good idea? I'm just more in this camp of I'm kind of excited for it because I think electric, and for better or worse, is the future, and it sounds like Ford's got the or we're reporting. 300 miles of range, possibly, multiple battery packs. But I'm very concerned the bean counters are going to get in the way and name everything Mustang. Like, you know, I know that they wanted to call this thing Mach 1 at first, and then everyone kind of complained, and now it's not that. But there's a lot of Mustang, it looks like, in this little teaser image. And I think it's just going to be Ford Mustang SUV EV, Ford Mustang F-150 pickup truck. I could just see this future of Ford trying to associate Mustang with EV for some reason. I don't know. What do you, what do you think, uh, Chris? So going off of what Greg's, I think from kind of what we've heard, I have a feeling you might be right. We did a story, I think like two, three months back now about Ford kind of wanting to create sub brands within its range. So there'd be like the Mustang sub brand and the Bronco sub brand, which we're already seeing with, there's going to be the big Bronco and then the smaller one. So I, for, for better or worse, I think you're right there. Looking at this line drawing though, what gets me when I keep looking at it is I'm trying to figure out, is Ford going to surprise us and make this thing a two-door or three-door with the hatchback? Because I'm trying to figure out how you would incorporate rear doors into this design the way it's shown here, at least. Because it looks like where the rear door openings would be would be into the fender uh, kind of where the fenders widen out and where the uh, roof starts to drop downward. So I I'm wondering if maybe there couldn't be a surprise in store. I, I don't know. You know, now that I'm looking at it and you point out where the rear fender starts, you're right. That starts way further up than you you would think it normally would if there's a door there. Um, although it, it's possible the rear doors could be like a half door situation, which sure. we've been seeing a lot of lately. Um, man, if it, if it were uh, a two door um, or a three door, that would be that would be shocking. Um, I you know to to reply to your comment, Greg. I and I I think I've said this on the podcast before. Even I think associating um, their first really um, serious attempt at an EV with a Mustang is a really good idea because one thing that. I see that's lacking um, with the competitors that that try to take on Tesla and and let's take the Chevy Bolt for example is a lack of a cool factor. Um, the the Bolt is an exceptional electric vehicle um, ever since it came out and and more so now that they've added even more range. You know it's a 250 plus mile EV that is very affordable and functional and 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 does does everything you want. But it doesn't have a cool factor. And the problem is, is that Tesla right now, you know, has the cool factor of the iPod in like, you know, 2002, right? It's off the charts. So every, everybody that tries to go up against Tesla, I think, is missing that kind of uh, key element, even if they're making a, a, a decent or even a great product. And I think what Ford is trying to do is take their one asset that they know is cool, that, you know, is is cool to the bone and associating it with EVs. Now, the question is, I and so many things we don't know, is how that's all going to come together. You know, is it going to have um, impressive enough range? Is it going to have impressive enough performance? Um, is it going to look cool like a Mustang? And I think based on this um, teaser, uh, you know, again, it's just some lines, so we're not seeing a photo or anything, but I think it, I think it will look cool uh, based on, on what we're seeing. Um, so I'm, I'm hyped for it. I'm jazzed. I, th I think it's their, um, it, it's their game to lose, uh, right now. They're, they're setting this up nicely as to be a really, um, uh, really attractive EV that could, um, shake things up. And that's really been the hard part is to shake up this, uh, this EV market in the U S because it's 85%, uh, Tesla. And that's not hyperbole. That's, it's like 85% of all EVs sold in the U S are Tesla's. Um, and the, the Porsche, the Taycan, uh, that was, a, a I think a nice, um, shot across the bow, but also it, it wasn't a direct hit either just because the, the, the price was so high. 
uh, or is so high and they put such an emphasis on performance um, that the range uh, wasn't there where it is in the Tesla. So I don't know. I, I think this this Mustang is so interesting or this Mustang Mustang inspired EV crossover. We really need a name for it because I can't keep <laughs> <Really>? saying that. <laughs> that is too much. Um, but November 17th. So it's actually for those who don't know, it's actually the uh, Sunday, uh, which uh, it's on the Sunday of the week that the uh, LA Auto Show is happening. So it's going to debut before the LA Auto Show. And then I assume they're going to have the actual car at the show as well uh, later that week. So we will be there um, covering everything and and bringing you videos and pictures and analysis of this because I think this is this might be the biggest debut of the show. Um, you know, I, th- I think it definitely is of what we know so far. So uh, we'll wait and see if uh, some other debuts uh, come up that challenge it. But I don't know. Um, All right. The other thing that happened this week, um, in addition to the Golf 8 debuting, was the Tokyo Motor Show. Um, And this is a a kind of a weird motor show for us uh, because, A, it's really hard to get to. uh, So it's hard for us to cover sometimes. But we did have, I think, four editors um, from across the Motor One network in Tokyo uh, this week to cover it. And there were definitely some interesting debuts. There was I wouldn't say there was as many as maybe what we're used to seeing in like a Geneva Motor Show or a Frankfurt or a Detroit, uh, but there were still some good ones. Um, I, I I wanted to bring up a few, like maybe we could each pick um, the one debut we thought was most interesting. Um, and I'll go first. I thought the most interesting one, uh, speaking of electric vehicles, was the Mazda MX-30, which is Mazda's very first electric vehicle. Um, it's a really interesting design in that it's uh, kind of like a hatchback and it has two regular doors and two half doors behind it that open in a suicide style. So very much like the BMW i3, um, which I'm going to bring up again because it has to share some other things in common with the i3. Uh, I think it looks really cool and the interior is particularly futuristic. That's actually what I love about a lot of the EVs that come out is they tend to have uh, very futuristic interiors to like accommodate and accentuate all of their, their technology. Um, the, the thing that is, while I think the design is cool and the packaging, what's disappointing is the actual hardware. Um, it has a fairly small battery that is probably, it's not rated, um, uh, in the U S yet by the EPA. Uh, but it looks like it's only going to be in the low hundreds in terms of, uh, range in miles. Which is just Um, embarrassing, honestly. It is. It is. And, and that's why I brought up the I3 because, uh, the i3 is another vehicle that has like in- really cool design, really interesting packaging, and BMW put a way too small battery in it. Now, what's interesting is that BMW also added a strange little range extender as an option on the i3, and it was rumored that Mazda was going to do the same and that it was going to be a Wankel engine uh, at- for the range extender, but they debuted it. And they never mentioned the range extender, and they just debuted it as an EV with a really small battery. And of course, they have a bunch of um, reasons why they say having a range of like, uh, again, we don't know what it'll exactly be, but let's say between 120 and 140 miles, something like that. You know, they say that, you know, that's enough for most people to drive in a day and, and all of that. But uh, I've made this argument uh, to many people that, you know, range anxiety is real and it's not really about how far you can go in a day it's just about uh it's about uh, for one thing i think it's about matching gas cars if that makes any sense like you know people are going to look at evs as inferior to to gas cars until the range question is just equalized and i think to do that you at the at the minimum need more than 200 miles uh and in my personal opinion i think 300 miles is better, but I, you know, 200, 250 at least. And for this, yeah, I, I, I don't know. They, they made a lot of comments that it'll, it'll do well in Japan. So I don't maybe they'll make changes before it comes over to the U S like add the range extender or possibly a bigger battery, but I don't know what the platform can handle. So I, it was a very, very weird debut because it's a super interesting car and had, had was really neat design and really clever packaging. But yeah, the, the battery size just kind of made me do a sad trombone sound for it. Well, I didn't hear that, or maybe I'm just out of the loop, but did they, they didn't announce it was coming to the U.S. yet. No, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, but 
I, I imagine they have plans to sell EVs around the world, so we'll wait and see what those are. Uh, if they're only selling it in Japan, maybe that argument holds for only 120 miles will be you know plenty for everyone because it's a lot smaller uh, distances to travel there. But um, even still, if you're going to sell it anywhere outside of, of um, Japan, I don't think that argument holds anymore. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if that will ultimately make it here. I, if I were a gambling person... At least at the range it has, I would say it's. I think it'll be like the Honda E, something we kind of look at afar. Like bring it here, even though it's really not perfect because the range is a little too small, but it's just cool enough. We want it, but I, I would imagine they'll probably wait it out. There's not a huge incentive to bring it here with that low range, and we're not big EV buyers. And it, I mean, this is the this is Mazda's. I mean, first experimentation with electrification altogether as far as i know i mean maybe i you know maybe i shouldn't say that because i haven't looked closely at all of their japanese offerings but you know they haven't even had a hybrid in the u.s you know so um it kind of feels to me like they're they're leapfrogging right to full electrification um and yeah i don't know i'm you know it's funny you know you say uh, i i gotta read the press release because all of the uh, st uh, press photos that they released with it are not of the car in Tokyo, <laughs> unless Tokyo looks a lot like Europe um, in these pictures. Um, well, Greg, what was what what did you think was the most interesting car uh, at Tokyo for you? I mean, there's a difference between interesting the one that interested me. The most interesting was definitely the Suzuki Hustler because why you would name it after Larry Flint's magazine is strange to me. The uh, most the interesting to me before, as a U.S. Though. consumer, though, is the Subaru LeVorg prototype they brought out, which we're not getting the LeVorg as a wagon, but it pretty much signals what the new WRX is going to look like. And it looks pretty good. And the LeVorg has this new 1.8 liter turbo flat four that I would imagine is not going to come here, but maybe the WRX will have a 1.8 liter turbo flat four. Uh, the the car is oh, interesting to me, and I think it has, actually has an impact on us where a lot of the other stuff that debuts in Japan is interesting, but it's tough to find where it ties into the U.S. Right. Interesting but irrelevant, usually. Which is a bit it, of, it, it's really handsome. Like, you know, it's a really handsome car, and it is just unfortunate that, you know, Subaru sells so many Outbacks here that they have no incentive to bring this here because it would just no. steal sales from the I, Outback. Even just jack it up a little and put some body cladding on it, I mean... There's going to be some purists who are like, I wanted an actual WRX wagon like the Lavorg is supposed to be, but I'd be happy with like an Outbackified version of it. That would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, did you guys see that article recently? Um, I forget where it was published, but uh, it was something like 85% of all station wagons sold in the U.S. are, out, are Outbacks. Yep. I did see that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. People love Outbacks. So yeah, if you're... Yeah, we, if you're Subaru, I would love to say, like, if you're Subaru, you should be the, the wagon, uh, you know, carrying the banner for wagons and bring as many over as you can. But you're right. I think their incentive is just to sell more Outbacks. Especially since they're made in, you know, Subaru makes the U.S. Outback in Indiana. So, you know, they don't have to worry about tariffs. It's just yeah. kind of, you know, they make them there and bring them in. So it, there's not much incentive to go elsewhere. Yeah, they're they're set up perfectly for that. Uh, how about you, Chris? What did you like or find interesting from Tokyo? So my f personal favorite is the absolutely bizarre Suzuki Waku Spo or SPO. I'm not exactly sure how you're supposed to say it. But if I'm honest of what the other important debuts there, the Nissan Aria concept is probably yeah. more important yeah. Even if I don't find it quite as cool, it's an idea for kind of a mid-size electric crossover. And it's probably kind of the shape that we're going to see from Nissans to come. It's got this big arching roof that looks really nice, but that it's pointy at both ends. It's a pretty handsome vehicle and it's not, you know, it's the type of thing that you could kind of imagine seeing on a Murano or something like that in the future. And a no, they, they've trademarked place. the name Aria here, and that car looks pretty production ready. So that car actually, I, I forgot about it, Chris, but that's probably the most important debut there to America because we know they have a rogue-sized SUV thing coming, and that's it pretty much. Oh, and I Nissan, did not realize that they uh, patented or trademarked the name. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah Nissan. Oh, well, first of all, I love the name because it reminds me of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Second of all, Nissan, I, I'm surprised that, that Nissan 
it's taken them this long to get a second EV model on the market. Like maybe it makes sense because while the Leaf is, I don't know if the Leaf is, is still the best selling EV in the U.S. or if the Model Three overtook it, but nevertheless, it was uh, and and has been a a good selling uh, electric vehicle in the U.S. Maybe it never sold enough though to justify a second vehicle. But the Leaf has been around so long, and Nissan has beaten the drum for EVs and been, I would say, a genuine advocate of them as opposed to building them to meet compliances or Definitely. you know laws. Um, that I'm really excited for them for their like second effort and the fact that it'll be uh, a crossover, I think will be cool. Um, we were actually just shopping for um, a slightly used EV and uh, I test drove a Nissan Leaf and believe it or not, I'd never driven one. Um, and it was remarkable. I was, I, I, it was, it was absolutely, it was like a, two, it was like a 2016 um, and they had upgraded the battery. So it had 107 miles of range. And again, this was, this is at a time when, yeah, the, they didn't, the EVs did not have large ranges, but Nissan was trying to push the envelope and push it as high as possible so that they wouldn't be just, you know, second cars and that people could use them. Whereas other, you know, uh, automakers were, you know, like Fiat were happy to sell the 500 with 80 miles of range and never touch it and, and actually encourage people not to buy it. Nissan was the opposite. Um, so yeah, this Aria, I, 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 I agree. I think it's the, perhaps the most significant vehicle at the show because it supposedly alludes to the, the EV crossover that we're going to get in the U S. Um, so yeah, very good, very good choice. Although I like your first choice too. That Suzuki concept was hella cool. Yeah. Do you like the looks of the, um, Aria though, John? I do. I, well, okay. Nissan design, I'm always a little torn on. Um, I, I don't know that. I, I Let me put it this way. I don't have faith that the production car is going to look as good as this. So even if even if I say I like this, like I don't really think the production car is going to look this good. See, I think um, that thing looks pretty production ready. I think it'll look a little worse in production form, but I think it'll look about 80% of that. It has I, real I, mirrors uh, on it, too. Like, that's the key when you know a car is like at prototype stage or full concept and they put real mirrors on it not stupid camera mirrors or maybe not stupid well, real, I mean, that's smart, real mirrors and and yeah real mirrors and real doors with an actual b-pillar that you're right that does uh suggest production ready and the interior uh uh well the interior looks a little concepty it's a little concepty um, but it looks like you could overly, you know so. erase some of the you know whatever they ha- you know like shiny bits and you'd have a pretty close to real interior but I like it. It's very, the interior is very uh, similar to the Model 3, where it's just like this big screen on the dash and like very few buttons otherwise. Um, very cool. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a cool, yeah. Nissan needs to, I think, step up and, and take their, t- kind of take their place as the company that has been, aside from Tesla, you know, pr- you know pushing EVs for so long. Um, I don't know. They have a lot of other things that they're trying to. <laughs> you mean uh, like make money? Right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe that's not in the cards for them. Um, all right. Uh, well, we want to hear what everyone else uh, thinks about uh, the Golf 8, uh, the Mustang EV, and everything that was at the Tokyo show. Um, so you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we are at MotorOne.com. And, of course, on our website, MotorOne.com, where you can find us in the comments. Uh, Coming up, we're going to find out what we've been driving this week. But before the break, I want to remind everyone that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, and wherever else that you listen to your favorite podcast. Welcome back. Uh, During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with you, Greg. What are you driving? I am in the 2023. 2020 Mazda 3 sedan. I wanted to say 2023 because the three in it, but it's a 2020 Mazda 3 sedan with all wheel drive, uh, top of the line, almost $30,000. It's a beautiful car. It's something about it. I just don't love. I like it a lot. The interior is gorgeous. The, the exterior, I think the sedan looks better than the hatch and you drive it and it feels like a little luxury car, but that little bit of like soul that the old three had or other Mazdas have it's a little less present and probably better for actually convincing people to buy these cars. But for somebody who gets in a three and thinks like that's going to be fun to hustle around, it's a little less, feels a little more adult. 
Oh, this is actually a really good word for it. It feels a little like a little bit more adult and less fun. <laughs> um, mm. I mean, you're in um, you're driving around in Miami, right? Yeah. So it's actually pretty good for Miami. There's very few, you know, you got on ramps to kind of play with. And besides that, it's mostly straight lines. So it's really great. for. Well, there. I was going to ask, not that there's a lot of snow falling where I am in Cleveland right now, um, but, you know, it has all wheel drive. Do you think that a, do you feel like that um, you could feel that uh, the presence of the all wheel drive or did that affect the driving in any way? And also follow up question. Do you think that that makes a difference to the buyer in this class? Well, a couple things on that. The first thing is the all wheel drive. I was curious, too, if I'm really noticing or not. There's I want to say it torque peaks 186 pound feet at 4000 RPM. So below that, it's not like it's gutless. But you feel a little like, come on, baby. And I feel like the front wheel drive one might have that a little less. It might be the extra weight of the whole rear differential. But I will say I've been I was like on a slightly dusty road and I had to beat somebody off the line to get in the other lane for uh, to get on the on ramp once the light turned green. And the front wheels gave a nice little spin before it sent power rearward. So I was kind of depressed how slow it was to react and also Maybe it's not as big of a thing as I would think. I wish I had time. I would love to drive a front-wheel drive one to get a better vibe if that's kind of sucking a little life from it or not. But I do think this segment, maybe it's not a be-all, end-all thing to have all-wheel drive, but I think it's a nice thing to have. You look at how Subaru is not having much trouble, it seems, selling anything, and they're all-wheel drive. It yeah, gives... but with Subaru and the Impreza, I feel like they get, like obviously they Subaru gives you all-wheel drive standard. Plus, they just have, have engineered and, and evolved their system for so long. There's, there feels like there's zero penalty in the Impreza for having all-wheel drive. Like, the, the fuel economy is just as good as, the front, as its front-wheel drive competitors. Where I feel like every other automaker who offers all-wheel drive makes it feel like an extra thing that comes with compromises. Like, A, you have to pay more for it. And B, your fuel economy is going to go down. So that's why I feel like in this segment where you have, like, a Subaru next to you, all-wheel drive never looks good as an option on another car. You know, it kind of just always makes me look at the Subaru more. Well, I will say, I, I think you are probably like a lot of consumers who, people like Subaru, and I like Subaru a lot too. Yeah. But in theory, if you get in a Subaru Impreza and you're like, I just need a small car with all-wheel drive, I don't like A, B, or C about this Subaru. What else can I get? There's nothing else. Mazda's at least filling right. a gap in the market. I don't think many people get in the Impreza and say, I hate this so much, I'm looking for something else, unfortunately for Mazda. Yeah, but, it's a small gap to fill. Yeah, but you know, if there are people who get in and are like, man, I just hate this infotainment system in the Subaru, which I, they'd be crazy. I love the but, Subaru infotainment it, system, but now there's the Mazda to look at. It's an even smaller gap because most people would would think I want all wheel drive. I'll just get a crossover. Like like the, I don't think like like the market of people who want small sedans is already shrinking. And if those people also want all wheel drive, there's so much pressure to push them into a a crossover of which you know almost all of them have all wheel drive. So I don't know. It, it, like like offering all wheel drive just seemed like a strange decision to me with a Mazda three. Uh, and I've I've uh, driven it too. And and honestly. I, I couldn't really feel a difference. Um, so it was, you know, I, I said in my head, well, I wouldn't pay extra for this. I mean, it might be nice in the few months of the year uh, where it's winter. But, you know, like we always say, a good set of snow tires does most of the work, you know, anyway. Um, so I also think, so, though, yeah, part so. of it in their marketing minds, totally me guessing here. But, you know, it's no secret Moz is trying to, I don't know if reach full premium level status, but, you know, move up from being more than just your typical mainstream brand. And they probably are looking at Audi and you can get an A3 with all wheel drive. They're like, they're doing it. People expect all wheel drive to be available in your, you know, entry level luxury ish sedan. We need to offer this. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I think every almost every Mazda that sold is trying to punch above its weight class in terms of luxury uh, and, and does so very well. Although there's still in my mind uh, just a dissonance with associating Mazda with luxury or or competing against luxury brands. Like I, I mean, to me, just having covered it for so long, it's it's a mainstream brand. It's not a luxury brand. But every time we drive one or put it in a comparison test, we comment on how much more luxurious and premium it feels versus a Ford or a Honda or or whatever. So they, well, they are doing well at that, but I don't know if they're going to overcome 
just people's mindset of where Mazda is in the pecking order. Have you driven an A3 sedan or CLA recently, Greg, that can you comment on that at all? I haven't driven a CLA in forever, but I remember not being, oh, I haven't driven the new CLA. So it's not fair to me for me to comment on the old CLA or the new A-Class. Um, A3, it's been a couple years, but the A3 feels, you know, always felt really good. It's, you know, an Audi Golf for better or worse. Sure. It's MQB and it, it's kind of like what the three to some degree feels like where it's this really comfortable, nice, almost isolated. But if you kind of get on it, there is enough there where it's still like engaging enough, but it's not the old three or a Civic or, you know, something that's a little bit more involving with you but it's if i you think were it in the market, a good compromise though, of hitting if, what if you people were the, really want if you were in the market though do you think you would genuinely cross shop a mazda 3 with an audi a3 depends because in the the world we live in where we're so boxed in which is i wish the world was more like this where it's just like hey i'm looking at a new car new a3 or new mazda 3 i don't really think so but if somebody says hey there's a cpo audi a3 here with 20,000 miles on the odometer and it's you know about the same it's about $30,000 and so is this Mazda 3 I think that's a fair you know I think Mazda's put itself in a position where people might say why get a slightly used Audi A3 when I can get a brand new Mazda 3 yeah possibly possibly like you could definitely see the the meeting the product planning meetings they're having and the lines they're drawing between uh like audi and themselves and and the situations where they might be able to pick up a sale uh i don't know but like i said it just seems like a narrow path to walk um that that doesn't necessarily doesn't lead to overwhelming amounts of sales uh but really leads to a good reputation and and i think a lot of critical uh praise which they're getting uh from people like us Uh, All right, let's move on. Um, Chris, I don't think you drove anything new this week, did you? Nope, nothing new. How about you? Uh, Well, I did have a a new car in the driveway. It was the um, Infiniti QX60, uh, which I've been calling Old Gray. (laughs) Um, And it's funny because I had just driven the Nissan Pathfinder uh, before it and kind of had the same feelings, which is that these are ancient um three row crossovers uh you know and they're related you know the infinity is is just the luxurious version of the of the pathfinder and when i get into it it really hits you on the inside because the controls the buttons the layout of the dash the screen the infotainment system are all a generation or two old like it all feels very old um however I, I, I wanted to guard myself against being too critical of it because I can usually get really down on cars that are that are just happen to be um, more than a few years uh, since their last redesign. Um, and, and so I was trying to have an open mind and and I've kind of evolved to have a couple to have positive feelings towards the QX60. For one, I think its exterior design has aged pretty well. Um, I, I particularly like the uh, the D pillar that has that that kind of signature uh, infinity character line in it uh, that I think works really well and actually serves a nice functional purpose because it makes a really big sheet of glass for the third row passenger if you, you happen to be sitting back there uh, and I think the front end of it looks good too so I think I think its design has has held up uh, fairly well and you wouldn't be ashamed to have it parked in your driveway uh, and as for the interior. Uh, even though everything looks to me old, I don't know that, you know, an average buyer who gets in it would would think that. And even if it is old, it doesn't perform poorly. It doesn't it's not ergonomically terrible, you know, so it's like it's not bad. It's just old. And I, I guess I can't say with 100 percent confidence that old equals bad in this instance. It's just I'm I'm sick of seeing it. <laughs> That's what I think is really hitting me uh, when I get in it. Um, but I think what, you know, I'm going to, uh, review this one and I think ultimately it's going to get dinged pretty hard for, uh, not driving particularly well. And when I say that it, it drives comfortably, um, especially, you know, on the highway, it's very comfortable, but there's, there's no driving enjoyment whatsoever. Um, the engine isn't particularly gutsy or powerful, uh, nor is the transmission, you know, uh, I think a perfect partner for it. Um, so there's not tons of power to play with the handling, the suspension, totally soft. I mean, you can't, 
you can't take speed into into corners with this thing at all. Uh, and it's just not fun to you know go run an errand in. It's it's very it's almost minivan like in its in its demeanor. Um, and that that sounds harsh, but. Um, again, I always try to put myself in the shoes of an average consumer and, and, and ask myself, would I notice this? Would I notice that it, it, it isn't as fun to drive as some others? And I think, you know, if I'm a person that's going to go drive a, a, a QX60 and then I'm going to go to a Volvo dealership and drive a, a, an XC60 and XC then I'm going to go to, a, you know, or XC90. Uh, and then I'm going to go around and drive some more. I mean, if I got to the like Buick X7, uh, I'd never think of the Infinity again, you know. Um, so that that's I think it's danger is one one drive in a more modern uh, three row cross, luxury three row crossover, and you're, there's no way you're going to buy the Infinity. And it's priced um, similarly if, too. It's not you know that's the thing with the car. I want to give it like you know everything you said. It's very minivan like. It's minivan without the space, and everything in it is old. That doesn't mean it's terrible, but it's not as good as the newer stuff. And you're like, well, maybe it's a cheap, you know, price for what it is, but it's not. It's priced about the same as like an XC90. Yeah. So um, I have the sticker for the one I'm driving right in front of me. Uh, out the door, it's sixty-two thousand, um, and the base price of it was uh, of this model was forty-eight thousand. This one is the Lux all-wheel drive, which I don't know off the top of my head is the highest trim level, um, but I, usually they are when they're media vehicles that we're reviewing. Um, and I mean, Nissan does have a knack of, um, even as cars get old, they do manage to like jam in all the latest tech features, um, which they've done here. Like, you know, it's got, um, you know, all the drive, uh, the, the drive assist stuff. Um, it's got, I mean, the whole roof has a moonroof. Um, what else? Apple CarPlay and all that. Like, so they, they jam in all the new stuff, but it just never feels like, the components they use are of the highest quality. Like, I don't know. I, Maybe this is not... just my perspective, but it seems like ever since Johan Denyishin left, it's just been kind of a, it's been a brand without any direction. Oh, treading water. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, what what is the last new Infinity that came out? QX50. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Which, is, which was a good one. Yeah, that felt like a good step towards like revitalizing the whole brand with new models and then stall, right? And maybe that has more to do with parent company Nissan and all the things it's dealing with. But, but yeah, the QX50 felt like a really good step in the right direction and then kind of nothing. Um, and it certainly, you know, in the crossover market is where you want to be, um, you know, launching your best products and your newest stuff. And this third row crossover segment is uh, ex- really heating up. Like I said, I mentioned the X7. Uh, that's BMW's first entry into it, and is a really well. X seven's a little uh, bigger, and they used to have an X five. It's a little bigger, but row. it's still a three row. It's still a three row luxury crossover. Yeah, the, this thing and though, it seems like it's drive. a car that you get because they have a really good special on it. Like I, if anybody pays full price for it, you. I'm not trying to be judgy toward people in their car choices. If you really like it, that's your car. Go for it. But if you're like, I'm only whatever with it, but I'm gonna get the Infinity, and you paid full price. That is crazy to me when, like, even the MDX, you know, the MDX drives well and feels a little bit special. You know, this feels like a Nissan Pathfinder with some lipstick on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we'll see. Uh, my review will be out uh, in a few weeks, and you can you read uh, all of my opinions there again. Um, but so that's what we're driving this week, and that brings us to the end of our show. Um, you can follow Chris Bruce at Chris Bruce 1985 on Twitter. Uh, Greg, I don't have your Twitter handle in front of me. Can you remind me? The Thinker. Oh, The Thinker. How could I forget that? That's my favorite. I thought Twitter you were setting me time. up because last time you did that, I, I you're wasn't. like, yeah, I just wanted you to say it, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't. I really didn't have it written down. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank you two for being on the show with me this week. It was great being here. Thank you, John. You're welcome. And of course, thank all of you out there for listening. Um, Come back next week when we'll have an all new episode.